Just a brief word, Pat Quinn, one of the missionary sisters of service living here in Toowoomba, and on behalf of the sisters, it is absolutely delightful to see you all here, especially our beautiful speaker and our bishop and every other single person. We're very excited about this and we're very grateful to have this opportunity. Thank you. So we we'll welcome with Bishop Ken for joining us today. The Missionary Sisters of Service, we have three with us today, Sister Pat, Mary Cleary and Sister Nancy Doyle. We have two more sisters living in Toowoomba, Sister Cecilia Bailey and Sister Margaret Wincham, who are both unable to come. Since we last met in 2020, just prior to COVID, if we remember the ones who were here, uh, we've lost Sister Mari Carroll and Sister Beryl Gleeson. So we remember them. We also re um, welcome today um, if people have been before, the Chief the Executive Officer of Highways and Byways is now Jane Colopy, and Jane's come up from Melbourne to be with us today. And then there's our local Highways and Byways people who've got, and friends who've got their badges on, but we welcome you all here today and are grateful that you've come. So now I'd like to invite our Highways and Byways person, Carmel Singh, to do an acknowledgement of country. We respectfully acknowledge the Jarawa, Gaibal and Western Waka Waka peoples, the traditional custodians of this land where we gathered today. We would like to pay respect to the elders past and present, for they hold the memories and traditions, culture and hopes of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. May we continue to walk and work together in a spirit of reconciliation to build a future of hope for all Australians. Thanks, Carmel. Highways and Byways was established by the Missionary Sisters of Service to continue their mission and vision Father John Wallace had founded the group of sisters in 1944 in Tasmania. Their vision was to reach out to the isolated and marginalised. The sisters first came to our diocese in 1964 and have had a presence in Toowoomba ever since. The sisters' mission took them into the highways and byways to visit the isolated families on properties and in small communities. They visited families like mine to support our families and bring the message of the love of God. They met families where they were and many children received their religious correspondence papers from the sisters as well. We are still in awe of their fearlessness in venturing down those lonely, dusty roads. They were brave women. Today, as our dear sisters age, the mission entity of Highways and Byways has been established. And today we welcome Jane Colopy, Executive Officer of Highways and Byways in Melbourne, to elaborate a little bit more on the current projects that are being done by Highways and Byways. Thanks so much, Claire, and you speak so truly about the sisters and how inspiring they really are as I'm sure each of you know from your personal experience with them. Um, Highways and Byways currently reaches out to continue supporting people living remotely and regionally around Australia. We have three longer term programs, one in Queensland in Roma uh, with Megan Brown, who's sitting with us today, and two programs in North East Tasmania. Um, so the first program I'd like to speak to you about is um, Megan's program, Seeds of Connection. This is Megan and her cousin David. Um, they had a group of Indigenous children that they took, local Indigenous children that they took to Mount Moffat to experience their con connection with the land. 
um, and the photo is of them um, making a Kulamon bowl. So both David and Megan are really beautiful in their connection to the land and in passing that connection on, which is so important. Um, the photo of the group of women here is one of the Indigenous women's cultural programs that Megan has run and <clears throat> continues to run. And these are opportunities for Indigenous women to come together and share their story, which obviously for many years they were discouraged from doing, not sharing their personal story, not sharing their cultural story, and not sharing their language. So the opportunity for them to come together and, and even share that experience of essentially being silenced, I suppose, and of all the grief and, and other trauma, but also to celebrate the knowledge that they do have and the culture that they do have is really inspiring for each other, but it also um, creates, creates a foundation through which they can share their culture with us, which is really such an honour and so inspiring. Um, and that last photo is of um, so David's showing one of the young boys how, how they ask permission of the tree, ask permission of the land to make use of the land to make that cool mum bowl, which I think is really beautiful. Um, one of our other programs in North East Tasmania is run by Ta Tani and it's called Free To Be Girls. The actual program is Free To Be Time and Tani set this program up to provide one-on-one -on -one and group peer support for young women who are living remotely in Tassie. Uh, in Tassie, once you get to year 10, if you're living remotely, you have to leave home to go and do year 11 and 12. You have to go to Launceston or Hobart, which is a massive thing, particularly for girls that have lived quite remotely and often at the, since COVID particularly, but there's a lot of school refusal and a lot of girls that haven't even been able to leave home and, and be in, in any social context. So there's some fairly significant health issues that they're facing, um, mental health issues particularly. And so Tani, um, and Tani teaches other young women in the community in their 20s and 30s, who often with a social work background or counselling background, trains them to become facilitators for these girls. And often those sessions will just be driving in a car and going to a beach. And you'd think if you lived in North East Tassie, you'd be going to the beach or to the beautiful outdoors all the time. But a lot of these girls aren't because they can't drive and they're, some of them are at home looking after younger children, but they don't socialise with their own peers. So the need is so high um, and we see such great results from these one-on-one -on -one and group sessions where girls are then choosing that they realise they have wants and they have desires and I want to further my education and it's, it's scary but I can do it because I've got this support for myself now. So really powerful program. Um, and the next slide shows us the artwork of one of the girls, a couple of the girls, you know, that's, that's the only thing they know that they feel positive about themselves is their artwork. So that's sometimes how these one-on-one -on -one sessions unfold is the facilitators supporting the girls to explore, ex express themselves through their art, but also potentially explore a business selling their art or showing their art, um, which is really amazing. Our other program in North East Tassie covers that connection that the sisters have had. The sisters often speak about being formed by the land and in um, North East Tassie around St Helens and St Mary's, Todd employs four young men who otherwise wouldn't have work, living remotely, facing issues of living remotely and isolated, and he teaches them how to restore the land where um, corporate companies have come in basically and, and um, planted pine trees to harvest, um, often for the money goes overseas for those um, corporate arrangements. Um, so when the pine trees come out, the government mandates that you have to plant eucalypts again, but they don't restore the biodiversity of the land. So Todd teaches the guys how to restore that land in a minimal way. Without tree planting, it's really about removing the pine seedlings, identifying which plants aren't going to be conducive to the, the natural restoration of the land. So the guys he's employing learn all these skills as well as doing this great work on the land. They connect with the land, they feel better in themselves. They're a group of five, so they get to know each other, they feel supported. Um, this is Scott, one of the guys who doesn't mind me talking about him, um, and he used to work for the um, logging company, planting the pine trees, um, and the next image is fairly <laughs> shocking of, of the pine trees actually, of the eucalypts being burnt down. So they burn down the eucalypts, shoot the wallabies and the possums, and then plant the pines. 
because they thought, the logging companies thought they'd get a better harvest. After a year or two, they work out that pine trees don't belong in North East Tassie, <laughs> and actually the eucalypts would have been better just to harvest and replant themselves. But um, Todd used to work for one of those companies, didn't know the guys he was working with, was overworked in terms of hours, underpaid, and the money would all leave town and go overseas. Whereas when he's working for Todd, the money stays in the community. These guys know each other, they support each other. Todd's mental health and some of his addictive behaviour was really at the forefront when he was working for the logging company and now he's connected and he's got that support um, and he's doing some, a positive contribution and, and really connecting with the land. He feels really good about life and the addictive behaviours just aren't there anymore. So that's just one of the guys' stories. Um, some of the other guys have been in, um, in prison or there's been some you know, criminal behaviour and, and that kind of thing in there. Some of them come to Todd as part of their community service, um, but what a great community service that ends up supporting somebody in that way. So we're really excited at Highways and Byways and we're very thankful for all of you and everyone else that supports Highways and Byways to enable us to do these long-term programs. And they really supplement our small grants program, which has been around a lot longer. Um, where we, we give three or four thousand dollar grants each year to between 20 and 40 different programs around Australia and they range, um, I've got a few more slides actually, they range um, from every state and territory around Australia. That was actually um, the aggregate numbers for last year so um, if you add in we've actually supported six hundred and fifty thousand dollars worth of programs um, since our inception, which is amazing. Um, and moving through those slides, you can see all the places that the sisters have lived and worked in Australia, which is really the f when I first started at Highways and Byways two years ago, to see the concentration not be in the capital cities is amazing um, and really wonderful. Um, so some of our small grant programs explore those areas that our longer term programs do. The Desert Support Services um, was a $3,000 grant that bought a new drone that this Indigenous community were able to monitor their cultural burns um, and the footage, we have video footage from that as well which is pretty amazing and the people are like little dots and you just get a real sense of the expanse and size of the land. Um, and one of our other programs um, of the Gondwana program out in uh, New South Wales, you know, this is the Yarning Circle, um, which they had as culmination of their program, which is an eco restoration program, connecting different um, eco areas where good restoration has happened in the land, but they need to connect the corridor so that the wildlife can go through. Um, and the last slide I have is of our um, Food is Free program in, in Ballarat, which was set up for the residents, um, young people living with um, mental illness. So they live together. And the program was to encourage their connection to the land through a gardening program. So they'd um, be able to come in, learn some skills, and take some um, plants home with them and learn how to um, look after those plants and um, create a terrarium, which was exciting for them. So um, we have a widespread of programs which are really inspiring. And I mean, you can, t like $3,000 or $4,000 is not a lot of money. And the money, the grants generally go to volunteer groups. So they're people putting in their own time, like many of you and many of the highways and byways branch up here do. Um, and they do so much with such a small amount. So it's a really um, wonderful, um, really wonderful process to be part of from my point of view and a really beautiful legacy that the sisters um, are giving all of us um, by supporting it. So thank you very much for all your support and thank you to Tim for coming today. I must apologise, I forgot to say my name is Claire. <laughs> when Jane said it, I thought, oh. Now, the main event. Today we welcome Reverend Tim Costello to Toowoomba. He's been out walking the streets early this morning and going to different churches, getting a Sunday feel. Tim is a most respected community leader and sought after speaker on the social justice, leadership and ethics. Reverend Tim's experiences include 
Executive Director, Director of Mika Australia, Director of Ethical Voice. How most of us here probably remember him for 13 years until October 2016, he was a Chief Executive of World Vision Australia. Some of the other positions Tim currently holds are Senior Advisor for the Centre of Public Christianity, Chair of Community Council of Australia, Chief Advocate for the Thriving Communities Partnership. That sounds highways and byways connected, doesn't it? And he's also an advocate for the gambling reform and a popular author, but he's much, much more. And with all this life experience, we look forward to Reverend Tim speaking on a range of social issues facing our world. And the title we gave him was The Big Picture, Living in Hope and Awareness. Please welcome Reverend Tim. Well, thank you so much, Claire, for that introduction. It's pretty much as I wrote it, really. Um, a delight to be here in Toowoomba, and thank you for uh, coming out. Uh, I never take it for granted that people um, come to events like this. Uh, all we actually have in life, when you think about it, is time. It's why when someone wastes your time, they're really a thief. You don't get it back, do you? To choose to come and invest your time uh, around morally serious issues is, I hope, an investment. And your presence here this afternoon is really, really welcome. It's been a delight to meet uh, some of the sisters and stay with Nancy and meet Pat and Mary and some, and Claire, of course. And uh, as I was thinking about the highways and byways and uh, MSS Sisters of Service, um, my mind immediately just went to that extraordinary story, I guess a rural, remote, dangerous story in the New Testament about uh, a couple of people travelling on the Jerusalem to Jericho Road. Dangerous road, remote, and as we know in the story, there were some bad things that happened. And these extraordinarily courageous sisters um, whose faith has actually overcome their fears when you think of where they were driving on unmade roads way out in regional Australia and this work going on, it is a Jerusalem to Jericho road experience. It struck me just thinking about the sisters and thinking about the church. How the story Jesus told, we know it as the Good Samaritan, actually began with a question. The question was a highly spiritual question. A rich young lawyer said to Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? We think of eternal life as the ultimate goal because death will come to all of us, and is there a promise beyond death, eternal life? Actually, in the Greek, eternal life means the power of the age to come. That's what it means. And if we know our New Testament, we believe that in the resurrection of Jesus, that new age has begun. Just one person resurrected, a general resurrection yet to come, but in his resurrection, new creation, reconciliation, a new beginning. People living in the power of the spirit of the gospel story, demonstrating to this present age, only two ages, the age to come and the present age, the present age full of violence. We're all watching what's happening in Gaza. We can't escape it. Corruption, human cruelty, greed, the present age characterised like that, the power of the age to come, eternal life, is people who live out of that age to come as if it has begun. That's what I think the sisters have done. Choosing not to be primarily teachers or nurses, but to care for the vulnerable, the marginal in rural and very regional places and taking their own lives in their hands in going there. That question uh, 
is the question most of us in the church would like Australians to ask. We'd like them to come up to us and say, tell me, Reverend, tell me, Bishop, how can I inherit eternal life? Because we're pretty well theologically trained to be ready to answer that question, right? I have to say in my 40 years of ministry, no Australian has ever come up and asked me that question. I don't know about the bishop. No one's ever asked me. And I'm ready. You know, I could give them a great answer, but no one ever asks. It's interesting to me that when Jesus has asked that question, he doesn't give an answer. It's a bit disappointing because I could. I'm sure the bishop could. Why doesn't Jesus give an answer? It's an anxious person asking, what can I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus just throws a question at him. Well, what do the scriptures teach you? This lawyer, I was a lawyer for 15 years. I know most of you can't stand lawyers, but this lawyer gives a pretty brilliant answer. He summarizes all the law and the prophets and he says, well, love God with all your heart, mind, soul, strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. We know it's a brilliant answer because Jesus congratulates him and says, do that. Great answer and turns to go. I like summaries. If you ever read the Bible, have you noticed there's a lot in it? <laughs> and it's pretty complicated. And working out the main message from Genesis to Revelation is pretty labyrinthal, right? Here is a brilliant summary. Love God with all your heart, love your neighbour as yourself. Pat won't mind me saying, she said just as we are talking before, at 13, she came to terms with the fact that God loves her. And so she said, I want to spend my life loving others. That is really the summary of the Christian message. Well, that brilliant summary didn't see the lawyer walk off smiling and thinking, right, got a great, I gave a great answer, off to do it. I think as a lawyer, I was one for 15 years. You as a lawyer always want to cover every escape clause, every loophole, every out. Particularly if you're doing court work, I learned this badly as a young solicitor. I, was representing a kid in trouble. I had a hurried conference with his teacher who'd come to give evidence at the court. He said, yeah, yeah, little Johnny's doing much better. I can give evidence to the, the magistrate. I said, great, put him in the box. Gave good evidence. My, Johnny's really doing better. He was a lot of trouble. Then I asked one question too many. This is a fatal legal mistake for beginners. I said, maybe you could tell his worship how little Johnny is doing better. The teacher said, well, he was truanting from school. Now he turns up one, maybe two days a week. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I'd never asked. That evidence was now in. There's no escaping. I think this is what happened to this lawyer. He's going, I know how to love God. It's sacrifices in the temple, it's obeying the Jewish law, it's paying my tithes, I know how to love God, but love of neighbour. Hmm. So he then asks a second question. It's not a spiritual question this time, how can I inherit eternal life? It's a social question. The first question is very eye-centred. I want to know how I get eternal life. It's otherworldly, I'm going to die, what's next, how do I get eternal life? The second question he asks is, and who is my neighbour? This is this worldly, not otherworldly. This is social, not spiritual. This is about we, not I. When he asks this question, who is my neighbour, Jesus does respond. He tells the whole story of the Good Samaritan. I reckon London to a brick, by the end of the story, that lawyer wished he had never asked. <laughs> I reckon he wished he had never asked. Well, of course, in the story, that Jewish lawyer's 
heroes, a priest and a Levite, see the beat up man and they pass on by. Probably for good spiritual reasons, they'd be unclean, they might have had duties in the temple, they couldn't perform their duties if they had to go through ritual cleansing for being unclean. Maybe they had good spiritual reasons. By the end of that story, the hero is a Samaritan who, as we know, the Jews hated. It's a bit like Israelis and Hamas. It's hatred. It's hatred. And the little interesting detail that we often miss in the story is Jesus said, this man on the Jericho Road, a Jewish man, beat up, left to die, was stripped naked. We miss the little detail, stripped naked. I have a hunch that if the priest and the Levi could have told from his clothing that he was Jewish, he would have said, ah, oh, they would have said, we have duties. One of our mob, a fellow Jew, of course we have to stop and help. But they couldn't tell. And they were focused on whatever their important mission, often the spiritual mission. Of course, the grenade that goes off in the story is that the Samaritan couldn't tell either, could he? He was stripped naked. The Samaritan just saw another human and he stopped, bound up his wounds, took him to an inn, paid, said, whatever extra it costs, let me know, put it on my account. And Jesus asked this lawyer at the end who proved to be neighbour. You're worried about eternal life. Who proved to be neighbour? There's the gospel. That's a very powerful story that even in secular Australia still resonates. We can have the right thoughts or think we can, right deeds, or I'll say we do the right deeds, but actually, do we? Are we seeing another human, the image of God in others? You know, Jesus, uh, if I was to give him some advice, friendly advice, because it's Jesus, of course, Friendly advice, it would have been Jesus when you said, love your enemies. It's a bit utopian. It's over the top. It would have been more useful, Lord, if you'd said, avoid your enemies. That's quite helpful, isn't it? If you wanted to stretch me, maybe tolerate my enemies. Jesus insisted on love your enemies. Why? Because Jesus believed, even my enemies carry the image of God. When I look at another human, when I'm approaching another human, I'm approaching something of God. It's an awesome thought, isn't it? I was in Lebanon, well, Vision was feeding tens of thousands of Syrian refugees who had fought, fled the war into Lebanon in the Becca Valley and finished that particular tour of duty. I was back in Beirut, I was flying up the next day, I had a walk at night. And as I was walking back to where I was staying, a uh, Lebanese speaking sort of broken English said, hello, my name's Malak, would you like to come into my house? He was at the front of his house for a coffee. I said, oh, you speak English? Malak, oh, I'm Tim. Oh, okay, I'll come in. I walked in with Malak, total stranger. And there in his house was about 12 Syrian refugees sitting. I said, oh, Malak, you've got people here, I won't stay. He said, no, no, no. They're not guests, they live here. I said, who are they, Syrian refugees? I'm feeding them, they've got nowhere to go. I'm giving them some work in my solar panel business that he ran. They don't speak English, we can talk. And he got me a coffee, sitting with Syrian refugees. And uh, he said, I'm a Christian, the nuns. I was an orphan, the nuns took me in, and I'm a Christian. I went to politics, I said, the war in Syria. I said, as a Christian, as a minority, I guess you don't want 
the Sunni rebels to win, you'd be backing President Assad. He said, yes, Assad's a butcher, absolute butcher, but Assad will at least tolerate minorities in Syria, Christians and Shia and Alawites. If the Sunni rebels win, it'll be for Christians. I said, what about these Syrian refugees here? Who are they supporting? Oh, he said, they get up each morning, face Mecca, and they pray for the Sunni rebels to win. I said, wow, Malak, you don't know me, but I know about political tensions in a family. Uh, <laughs> and this is incredible. You've taken in people who are supporting the opposite side in a war and you're caring for them and feeding them. Why do you do it? Malak just looked at me and he said, because they're humans. I suddenly realised I was hearing the story of the Good Samaritan, which was just a few kilometres down the road, 2,000 years earlier. The power of this story, the power of the Missionary Sisters' service and what they've done. Well, when we're thinking about the big picture, it's not just the New Testament, it's also starting in Genesis, the stories of why service and love are so important. When we think about Genesis, we're thinking about in the beginning. The most amazing thing about the statement in the beginning is there is a beginning. Now science actually agrees with that. There is a beginning. Theologically what's important about in the beginning is this. We were not necessary. God did not have to create the world. There was a beginning. God out of love and wanting to create something beautiful creates something. He creates something. Then in our story we are told that though we are not necessary, God loves us, honours us. We have his image in us, male and female. The idea there of an image is sort of like a slanted mirror. What are we made to do? We are made to reflect God's love and creativity into the world, being image bearers. And we are meant to reflect the praise of the world back to God for his gift, his creation, pure love. Well, this is a very important statement because it says in the beginning, God created as pure gift. You know, the market paradigm Produces, has producers and consumers, where everything is a contract, a deal struck, usually for personal benefit, where we compete for finite, scarce resources, where the strong are those who are able to compete and outcompete those who have the burden of caregiving or are weaker or have disabilities. That market paradigm was even there in other faiths. Other faiths with their gods had a barter idea, a trading idea. If I make the sacrifice to these gods, then in time of war or sickness or famine, the gods will remember and we've got a deal. They will in intervene to help me. Lots of religions grew up around that idea of barter and trade. What in the beginning, and it wasn't necessary, God created as pure gift, means a disposition toward God of gratitude and praise. Not a disposition toward God of something to exchange. You see, in our world, those with nothing to exchange and the barbarity of Hamas that has led to this war now is seeing Gazans who for 15 years have had nothing to exchange. I've been to Gaza. It is the biggest open-air prison in the world. They 
have always for 15 years been under siege where the Israelis could turn off the water, the food, the electricity, the medicines, always. They have nothing to exchange. They get left behind. What's remarkable about in the beginning is the gratuity of creation, its gift, rather than the logic of necessity, forcing incalculable things onto the balance sheet. So, against a world, and this is what the sisters have represented by their calling, a world where everything has a price and anything can be exchanged, we actually act out of gratitude because God loved us and it's pure gift and we love in return. This is true even with nature, the environment. Nature's whole existence consists simply in fulfilling and unfolding itself purely for its own sake and without any thought of a goal. Nature, the environment, resists instrumental logic of the marker paradigm. Now we're blessed that we can steward and get resources and live from nature. But the marker paradigm, and by the way, God's loving creation, both have excesses of abundance. With God, it's the excess of beauty and abundance without needing to say, therefore, you've got something to exchange. In the marker paradigm, it's excesses of abundance where the rich and the billionaires have far more than they need. So much excess. And our magazines are full of profiles of celebrities with so much. I know a few of those celebrities. And I can tell you, a lot of them I know aren't happy. You see, the door to happiness turns outwards. When you turn inwards and in the market want excess abundance more and more and more, it never satisfies. Humans are wired to worship something. It might be worshipping money, it might be worshipping power, it might be worshipping sex. This is what the Bible calls idols that distort the image of God in us. When it's pure gift and love, the call to worship the true God, reflect back that mirror on an angle, the praises of the world to God, and reflect God's love into the world. Well... The Bible stands against that whole market paradigm. What deal can we make with God when he gives us everything we have? When God doesn't need us. That's what in the beginning was. God was still God. He actually made us out of love. We are just like joyful children on Christmas Day, receiving the gifts and responding with thanks and excitement at the beauty and the surprise. In this paradigm, creation as gift, the poor, the weak, the aged, those who have nothing to trade are not cast aside just because they have nothing to trade. God freely gives, even to those who cannot stand on their own two feet with nothing to trade. It's the prim primacy of gift, Genesis 1, which is the foundation for a caring, compassionate and safer world, inclusive world. It's gift out of love, and we respond in love and worship of that God. Well, last month, Antonio Gutierrez, the uh, Secretary General of the UN, said at the UN General Assembly that the world has become unhinged. It really resonated with me. He was talking about the institutions that the world had built, the Bretton Woods institutions, World Bank, IMF, United Nations, at the end of the Second World War, built to prevent war again after two world wars. And he was reflecting how there is now no trust in these institutions. A rules-based international order 
is being broken down. It's being broken down by authoritarian, ethno-authoritarian populist leaders. Populism is simply simple slogans for complex problems. Simple slogans like the elite. And the rest of us have been robbed by the elite. And there's a deep state and a conspiracy robbing us. Look what the elite have done. Well, we saw that in July 2016. Boris Johnson, Niall Farage, with the Murdoch press said the elite are trying to keep Britain from exiting the EU. It's the elite. And the vote, 52-48, was for Britain to leave the EU. Now today, if you go to Britain, you won't find Boris Johnson or Nigel Farage even talking about Brexit. It has been so disastrous. It is such a dud. It's economically hurting. It was sold that once Britain's out, an island nation will be able to stop immigrants coming. Far more are coming across from Calais than before Brexit voted. Funny about this, the elite, deep state, actually were right. Four months later, America in 2016 voted for Donald Trump. He talked about the elite and they're running the Democrats and they're ripping off America and he was going to be for the ordinary American to make America great again. Well, how did that go? Now, he's facing 91 charges in four jurisdictions. Republicans can't even elect a speaker. A number of those Trumpian Republicans are against America arming Ukraine because what's the Ukraine got to do with America? We're just going to make America great. They can't even vote to support Israel which has been the signature of Republicans because they're under the Trump spell. Who was actually right in that election? The good thing at least about democracies against authoritarian dictators is democracy muddles along, makes mistakes, but it does have self-correcting mechanisms. With authoritarian leaders, who uh, take over, you don't get the self-correcting mechanisms. Joe Biden did win, and it wasn't a stolen election, even though seven people died on January the 6th when Trump supporters stormed Congress. The bromance of Trump with Putin, his love letters with Kim Jong-un, the uh, Trump not supporting you know, Ukraine because he wants just to focus on America and the wall down in Mexico. You know, in 2013, I had an hour with Putin in his dasha outside Moscow. I was leading C20, Civil Society 20. It was part of G20. Russia had the presidency the next year, 2014, here in Brisbane. The uh, Australian government, Abbott was prime minister, had the presidency. C20 is an outreach group of civil society groups from all the G20 nations. Putin saw us. He had the media in the whole time. He gave us an hour. We had the earpieces in. You could tell Putin could understand English. He was taking notes as soon as I spoke. There was three or four of us from civil society. We debated the war in Syria. We debated why Putin was using a foreign agent's law to close down any Russian charities that took a dollar from outside, saying they're a foreign agent. I'd been well briefed by Russian civil society. I said to him, you only have one Russian word for two English words. Our two English words are politics and policy. You only have the one word. Civil society will criticise policy. It doesn't mean we're playing politics. This was a bit of a new idea for Putin and in that meeting he agreed to ask the Duma, their parliament, to actually repeal the foreign agents law. For 12 months I was a hero in Russia. Civil society said, that was amazing. How did you pull that off? When I saw Putin in Brisbane in 2014, remember that's when Abbott was going to shirt front Putin? I said to Putin, why haven't you repealed the foreign agents law? Ah, oh, he said, 
the Duma wouldn't agree. He controls the Duma. The most interesting moment was when I noticed he was wearing a cross. He noticed I was a reverend, KGB man wearing a cross. He said to me as a reverend, we're giving millions of rubles to the Russian Orthodox Church. I'm telling young Russians to go back to church. They've only got materialism and vodka in their lives. They need to go to church. I'm listening and nodding and thinking I can't criticise that. So I took a deep breath, pushed my luck. I said, um, it's very impressive, President Putin. But let me ask you a question. Why did you lock up Pussy Riot for seven years in Siberian camps. Pussy Riot were the anarchist girls group singing protest songs about Putin in the cathedral of uh, St. Saviour, Christ the Saviour in, in Moscow. Putin said, well, the church was offended. It was blasphemous. We are not tolerating that. They had to be punished heavily. I said, yes, I know the church was offended. I said, but surely President Putin, a Christian church, would say, though offended, we believe the gospel is about forgiveness. We don't want them sent to Siberia for seven years. A look of incomprehensible misunderstanding came over Putin's face. He turned to me and he said, why would a church ever say that? I realised the church had become a department of the state. Millions of dollars to build churches. I've since read the patriarch Kirill of the Russian Orthodox Church has called Putin a miracle of God. The war against Ukraine, fellow Orthodox believers, as a holy war. When the church loses what it's all about, seeing the image of God, standing up against what we call our enemy because we see the image of God and talks about love. One of uh, my friends wrote these words. Peacemaking doesn't mean passivity. It is the act of interrupting injustice. The act of disarming evil without destroying the evildoer. The act of finding a third way that is neither fight nor flight but the careful, arduous pursuit of reconciliation and justice. It is about a revolution of love that is big enough to set both the oppressed and the oppressor free. To quote, to quote Pope Paul VI, if you want peace, pursue justice. And finally from the Talmud. Do not be daunted by the enormity of the world's grief. Do justly now. Love mercy now. Walk humbly now. You are not obliged to complete the work, but neither are you free to abandon it. The Jewish Talmud. That's what the sisters have done over so many years. Thank you. Okay. Reverend Tim's told us that he's happy to take some questions now. He's had a little brief thing. Has anyone got any questions? And John will have a mic. So if you have a question, if you put up your hand and I'll try and spot you out to him if he can't see you. No one's game. <laughs> I'll come. Give them time. We've got Nev over here, um, John.
Tim, uh, <clears throat> I'm 75 and it's taken me that long to realise that you've got to love both sides, you know, like it's the individuals that matter and, uh, you know, like if it's taken me 75 years and the people that uh, make all the changes, you know, in a, in a, a war, they're much younger. Uh, the difficulty is how to get that message through at a younger age you know, so that we can uh, live a little more peacefully. And uh, I mean, uh, I can now pray w with equanimity you know, mm. uh, for in this uh, war, but one time I would have had one choice or the other, you know. Yeah. Uh, I suppose that's um, what they call perhaps wisdom, but uh, I don't know how we um, manage it when all the blood's uh, up and all the... Yep. So I'm one who believes that war has outlived its usefulness. <laughs> Whatever we think it achieves, it never achieves it. Um, Biden, in coded language, was saying that in Israel when he stood with uh, Bibi Netanyahu. We Americans, after 9-11, wanted revenge. We wanted justice, he said we got justice, but what he was really saying is we wanted revenge. And going into first Afghanistan and then Iraq, saw half a million innocent Iraqis lose their lives. Into the vacuum stepped ISIS. On and on it went, the horror. The uh, bombing uh, that's gone on for more than a week in uh, Palestine. You know, it's the most densely populated in Gaza, densely populated area. Absolutely, Israel has a right to defend itself. It was barbaric what Hamas did. But could our leaders just say Palestinian and Jewish children are equally loved by God, are e equally innocent? Whatever we think we're achieving by this, I'm not sure we're going to achieve it. That's why Gutierrez has called for a ceasefire to get people out for humanitarian aid. Biden got 20 trucks, just gone in today. But Gaza needs 400 trucks a day before the war it was getting. Now malnutrition, starvation happening in Gaza. Are we just going to watch and say, oh, well, the war will solve this? Um, War has outlived its usefulness. We've got to find other ways. Um, and Jesus, you know, when he said, blessed are the peacemakers, it's not about being weak and passive and not able to name evil, the barbarity of Hamas. But it is going. Whatever you do, seeking revenge because you are so distraught, actually leads to much, much worse things. Thanks, Tim. Could you just repeat um, the source for that quote, the act of interrupting injustice? Yeah. I want to share this. So that's my friend Simon in America, a Christian minister. Uh, I'll give you his full name and uh, even can send it to you. Do you want me to repeat it right now? Um, the name, no, I'll be able to Yeah. Okay, so it is... Uh, Shane, not Simon, Shane Claiborne, C-L-A-I-B-O-R-N-E. He's a minister, a Baptist minister. Don't hold that against him. Baptist minister. John, we've got one here when you're ready. Closer to home, we've just had a referendum, mm. um, which has been, well, it was peaceful, but um, it was fairly divisive as well, mm. and I'm just interested in your thoughts yeah. on which path we're going down now with that one? Yeah, well, look, I've got the car engine running and I, uh, <laughs> I'll get out of here quickly. I campaigned very strongly for yes. I campaigned with Noel Pearson. In fact, I wrote to him the day afterwards saying I'm gutted and uh, he texted me back, Reverend, no tears, move on. Much love, mate. And I thought, gee, I'm more gutted than him. And then it occurred to me Indigenous actually are used to this. They actually are used to this. 
I felt what was being asked, Australia could have done. Uh, I would often, in my campaigning, finish with a little imaginative story. If just pre we voted for our constitution in 1901, if Indigenous had gone to Edmund Barton, who became our first Prime Minister, Edmund Barton, who in 1898 in the conventions insisted on the race clauses being in our constitution, they're still there, when you heard, heard this divides us by race. Race is in our constitution. Barton insisted on the race clauses being there, and I quote him, to control inferior and coloured peoples, indigenous and particularly Chinese who might come. He insisted. In my imagination, I imagine indigenous leaders, Aboriginal leaders, going to Barton and saying, you're writing this new constitution, a new nation's coming into being, could we just ask two things? And Barton's saying, what are they? Could you in the constitution just acknowledge that we were here first? What's the second thing Barton might ask? Could you, with the laws under the race clause you now have to make about us, could we just have non-binding advice to, on those laws you're going to make? I think even the racist Edmund Barton would have said, is that all you're asking for? The only person in the um, constitutional conventions that led to our constitution that raised the question, what will happen to Aboriginals in this new nation was the New Zealand delegate. New Zealand were thinking of becoming part of Australasia. New Zealand had a Treaty of Waitangi from 1840, influenced, by the way, by William Wilberforce and the Evangelicals in Westminster. They'd seen what had happened here. Influenced, if I can just give you a bit of history, by Governor George Arthur. He was the governor of Van Diemen's Land who instituted the Black War, you know, when Tasmanian indigenous were hunted down across the whole island and then the few that were kept alive taken to Flinders Island. Governor George Arthur completely repented after he finished as governor of Tassie, Van Diemen's Land. He wrote to Lord Glenelg, the colonial secretary, who was a Wilberforce evangelical. He said, what we did in Van Diemen's Land was shocking. You are going to make the same mistakes setting up South Australia in 1836. Glenelg wrote into the letters patent setting up South Australia, Torrens was leading it, that they cannot be taking of indigenous Aboriginal land without a treaty, without purchase, without their consent. Torrens said, why should we have our hands tied in the way that the other colonies, New South Wales, Queensland, Victoria, Tassie didn't, and he completely circumvented the letters patent. Where Glenelg, the colonial secretary in Westminster, had more success was New Zealand. Why is there a Treaty of Waitangi in 1840? Because those Wilberforce evangelicals had the balance of power for about six years in Westminster and insisted it's the New Zealand delegate who asked the question in our 1890 uh, referendum. So what will happen to Aboriginals in this new nation? The answer he got, you don't have to worry about them, they're all dying out. No mention at all in our constitution, though so many constitutions around the world mention their first peoples. And by the way, because most Australians have forgotten this, when we voted on the Republic in 1999, the second question pushed by John Howard was we recognise Indigenous in the preamble. Who can actually remember this? A few of you can. That lost by more than the referendum on The Voice. That lost by more. Twice now we've said we will not recognise Indigenous in our constitution. It's going to be two decades or more before recognition, if it can happen, ever happens. So I am one who feels very sad about this. I absolutely accept that's the majority, or 6139, overwhelmingly knowing Queensland. 
But I just talked to you about Brexit. Yep, they had to go and withdraw from Europe. Theresa May, then Boris Johnson, who had a no-deal Brexit, a hard breakfast Brexit, cheered on by the Murdoch press. Now it's a disaster. You won't find people who voted no in Britain now. Just because it's a majority, you have to not ne necessarily say, therefore it is morally right. <laughs> Give it time. Same with Trump. Four months later, you vote him in. There's a whole lot of those people who voted for Trump who are going, what did we do? Just because someone wins an election isn't proof that it's morally right. Give it time. That's how I guess I'm feeling and comforting myself because uh, I did feel pretty gutted about the result. And can I ask, did you feel a bit disappointed, I suppose, that the um, church organisations weren't allowed a voice in the voice debate generally, whether they be Anglican or Catholic or Baptist or whatever, and it became sort of more of a celebrity um, or powerful news organisation? Yeah, look, Pitch. the uh, Yes campaign made lots of mistakes. The most fundamental mistake is no referendum has ever got up without bipartisan support. They needed to do that. Albanese was in a difficult situation because um, the leaders from the Uluru Statement said uh, just recognition in the Constitution alone without a voice isn't enough. So. He was on a hiding to nothing if he walked away from that. Dutton might have agreed to just recognition alone. I don't know, actually. I don't know. He might have. Uh, he promised a second referendum on recognition alone, and now he's withdrawn it. So I don't know. Um, when it came to churches, there were, there were church leaders who spoke out, but there were lots of people who were strongly no, and it became so divisive, I had lots of pastors say to me, I just don't even mention it. It's too divisive. Why bipartisan works is you transcend the political wiring. It was sad because it's a referendum, it's not an election. In an election I say, put on your red t-shirt, your blue t-shirt, your green t-shirt, go crazy, it's an election. <laughs> Be partisan. This is actually not an election, it was a referendum about what's good for the nation with Indigenous, but it became partisan. So it divided churches and uh, I think a lot of priests, pastors, ministers were then in a terrible situation in their congregations, I, I feel for them. Yeah. Thank you very much for your wonderful remarks so far, um, and particularly for your profound story on the Syrian refugees in Beirut. Now, um, I do have a question. So life is very fast paced now, and yet for young people, there's a distinct sense that we're running out of time, and that a future of peace, which has um, thus far been absent from our, pres uh, our past, will be out of reach soon. And we've heard today that we must act out of love for the oppressed rather than out of hatred for the oppressor. But how do young people act with love and patience without falling prey to the anger that comes from desperation and avoid burnout in what is evidently an uphill battle? Mm. Thank you, and thank you for bringing the age uh, range down in this forum this afternoon. Uh, and a wonderful, wonderful question. Yeah, look, I, I say uh, we have to keep hope alive. Um, I think there have been more terrible times in human history. My father, he died at 97, but he fought up in the Kokoda Trail when I was complaining at, I don't know, 17, 18, about getting up at 5.30 a.m. to do a paper round. My father said, son, at your age, I was dodging bullets in, from Japanese in New Guinea for two shillings a day. Don't you complain. 
And uh, it was good perspective to go, okay, for young, it feels like this is the worst and how do we keep... It ha it's ab absolutely not been the worst times. We need to keep hope alive. And uh, secondly, we have to keep acting out of love. Uh, love that listens, that says to people, what are you afraid of? Can we rise above our tribalism? All the problems we face require global vision and connection, whether it's climate change, refugee problems, whether it's peacemaking in the Middle East, it cannot be solved by tribalism, by the algorithms that uh, just choose our prejudices, send us the news stories where we think we're seeing something objective. Actually, we're just in an echo chamber. That's all we're in. I have a friend, in, he's a Christian, who really likes Donald Trump. As you can tell, I don't. We text each other furiously, and every now and then, one or both of us step back and say, well, it's good our identity is in Christ, not in politics. It's important to do that, to actually rise above it. And I'd say to young people, uh, this world needs you vo your voices rising above it, keeping hope alive, demonstrating love, listening, putting the arguments, showing courage, but not showing contempt for others. What's the terrible thing about contempt, and it's happened very fast with social media and institutions not being trusted, what Gutierrez was really talking about with the world unhinged, not trusting peacemaking, UN institutions, was he was saying, we've actually lost the ability to listen to each other, to disagree agreeably, to rise above that and say, but there are some institutions, humanitarian aid going in is the United Nations, pushing, it needed Biden there, and it's not nearly enough going into Gaza. But we shouldn't lose hope. We shouldn't go, ah, there's a deep state and all news is fake news and populist answers by authoritarian leaders playing to the base somehow are answers. They're not. They're simplistic answers, which is just the tribalism of a nation. For those of you who are Christians, go home tonight and read Acts chapter 1, verse 6. It's the last time the disciples are with Jesus. He's about to ascend to heaven. And it's the last question the disciples get to ask Jesus. So you got a last question, make it a good one, right? Jesus is ascending. What's the question they ask? They ask Jesus, is now the time you'll restore the kingdom to Israel? In today's language, that question is, is now the time you'll make Israel great again? Jesus won't have a bar of it. He says, no, no, you're to be my witnesses to the uttermost parts of the world. Everyone is made in the image of God. You're to witness that God made us all out of love. And in a world where Xi Jinping says, make China great again. Putin going into Ukraine, make Russia great again. Trump, make America great again. We actually have to say the Christian message is to make the world great again. All our problems need global cooperation. That needs to be the voice of young, connecting across continents and amplifying that voice and keeping hope alive. Thanks, Tim, very much for this afternoon. Mm. Um, quick question about the populism thing. Mm. Um, you mentioned Brexit, you've mentioned Trump, you've mentioned the voice. One common denominator in the way that's been all three were portrayed to the world is the Murdoch press. Um, what do we think, what do you think of the influence of that press and particularly of that man, a, a, a man who uh, bought so much of his Australian citizenship he gave it up? Yeah. Well, as you can tell, um, I'm not a fan. <laughs> uh, in this country, uh, Murdoch Press, 70% newspapers, uh, Sky TV, which is very strong in regional uh, Australia. I'd like Rupert Murdoch to just 
acknowledge some responsibility. He was forced to, when the world news of the world was found to be hacking Millie Dowler's phone, the little English girl who died, and the phones of British soldiers, deceased and their family members. Remember Murdoch had to say, this is the most humble day of my life, and he folded news of the world. It was a little bit of accountability then. But he's never apologised for just thumping out Brexit. What about apologising? You got it wrong. He was the cheerleader for Trump with Fox News. He faced some accountability when Dominion uh, voting machine sued him and he had to pay out nearly a billion dollars for stoking the lies of a stolen election. A billion dollars. They paid that out because Murdoch would have actually had to stand in a witness box and worse would have come out. But he still not apologised for Trump, for the, the great lie. He's had to pay a billion dollars. Um, when it comes to climate change, Lachlan is even more hardline than his father. Uh, I just like a little bit of apologies along the way. I really got it wrong. As you know, I think he got it wrong on The Voice too. But, uh, look, I might have hoped that James Murdoch would have been the successor. James actually has very different views on climate change about the the big lie, but he's gone for Lachlan, who's as hardline, if not more hardline, than his father. So I'm still very, very worried about it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Uh, could you please tell us a little bit about World Vision and your role in it? Mm, sure. So I, I haven't been at World Vision now for four years, but um, I still go to Uganda for them and still do work. Yeah, so World Vision's remarkable. Uh, the uh, World Vision Australia, and there's World Vision America and Canada and Britain and France and, uh, of course, Vietnam and uh, India. And so there's lots of World Visions and a federation of World Vision. It's in over 170 countries of the world. It's Major fundraising has been child sponsorship, where it's not all the money handed over the child, it's the child is guaranteed support, but the money goes for that child's community to have a school, clean water, health. Uh, so it's not just a transfer to one child, it's a transfer to the community. Uh, World Vision um, has never been busier. I spent uh, well, 15 years of my life, I was CEO, then chief advocate for another two years going to world disasters. And I think the Australian public were often pleased that we were there, someone was caring, and their generosity was often remarkable. In the Asian Boxing Day tsunami, where I got up to Sri Lanka within 24 hours, then Bande Aceh, we raised $110 million for the victims in six weeks. It's a lot of money. Australians trusting, giving, uh, life-saving humanitarian interventions. So uh, World Vision continues to be a very hopeful sign in this world as a, as a Christian organisation. Thanks very much, Tim, for the power of your scriptural reflection, especially. Um, but I'm very interested in the whole voice of the church in our society at the moment, because largely we have been relegated to silence in many ways. And even though we attempt to make statements and get um, people to consider the, the story and what needs to be considered, an example, euthanasia recently in Queensland, we put up some very fine arguments, but they were all ignored because largely the church is kind of relegated to, we tolerate you. Mm. We tolerate your voice. So just from your perspective, you, you certainly have a voice um, within our country, but how do you think we should 
allow our voice to be heard again or how do we make our voice be heard again mm. on very, very significant issues that face our country. Yeah. Look, it's remarkable to me that the church here in Australia hasn't told its story as powerfully as it could or should. Um, in Australia, of the 25 biggest charities, 22 are Christian faith-based charities. World Vision's one of them, but it's the Caritases and St Vincent de Paul, it's Uniting Care. In America, of the 25 biggest charities, only 10 are Christian faith-based charities. In Britain, of the 25 biggest charities, only six are Christian faith-based charities. The heavy lifting and the MSS sisters have been an example of this, in Australia is still largely done by Christians. And Australians respect that. They know the Salvation Army will be there. They know St Vinnie's will be there. It seems to me that the church needs to regroup from just pronouncements uh, where the media will choose to go to us when it's abortion or gays or euthanasia to say, our story is so much bigger. The actual caring structure in this society is still strongly powered by Christian people. So I think putting the voice in the wider context actually is both educative and it's a, it's a much more powerful story. We're not just speaking out because we've got some hang-ups about sex. That's how secular media often see it. By the way, the sexual taboos that Christians, you know, are identified with, they were life-protecting, life-saving, life-preserving for women in the first three or four centuries. In Roman society, men owned women's bodies. Masters, certainly slaves. If uh, a woman got pregnant, abortion, infanticide, if the child was a, a girl, it was just de rigueur. It was the norm. It was incredibly uplifting and protecting for women. We don't quite tell the stories. They think we've just got old, passe, fuddy-duddy old views. They're quite liberating views. They've actually shaped. Tom Holland, one of my favorite writers, not a Christian, his book Dominion on the reflection on the cross, worth reading, secular historian. He says, when secular people make judgments in this society, he's talking about England where he lives, but it's true out here. They're often making judgments without realising it through a Christian lens. The power of the story of dignity that comes from being made in the image of God. The other thing coming from being made in the image of God is not just dignity from which flows universal human rights. It's also humility. We're only made in the image of God. We are not God. Humility. We're seeing floods of narcissism. My daughter's on TikTok. Boy, are there a lot of narcissists on TikTok. And they're all around us, as if I'm the centre of the universe. I was in Paris once, walking with my wife, and this young woman coming toward me had a T-shirt on, and it said, Kate, I worship myself. <laughs> I was so staggered, I just stopped, and she spoke English. I said, is your name Kate? She said, yes. I said, oh, and do you worship yourself, Kate? She said, yes, I am the sole person worthy of worship. And I said, well, Kate, all the best with your religion. <laughs> <laughs> so the church's message made in the image of God is dignity, and that's the secular people often making judgments without knowing they're making it through a Christian lens, and it's humility against narcissism. But I think when you add that into the service that Christians still do in this country, there's a story we have to tell better. I saw across the front of a four-wheel drive at Westridge on Saturday morning. It's all about me. Get over it. <laughs> across the front of the vehicle. Yeah. Sorry, I diverted. David Tutty is our Executive Officer of the Toowoomba Social Justice Commission. And David's just going to grab that microphone from John and come up and offer some thanks. Well, 
I've been asked to speak on behalf of the sisters of Highways and Byways and in fact of all of you to say thank you to Tim. We have invested our time wisely. Thank you, Tim. Thank you for your energy, passion, for the experiences you have shared, for your insights, and for your faith. You have, and I've done a bit of homework, you have been part of attempting to form the moral compass of this country for many decades. And we thank you for that. Thank you very much. And you will know that Pope Francis has a special love for the Good Samaritan story. I do. For Tally Tutti. Um, an entire chapter reflecting on the story. And in some ways, it's such a powerful story for all of us and for the way we are called to live our lives. So we thank you for that insight and for the stretching of our imaginations as you told that story. I'd like to thank you also for the way you've woven in um, some of the connections with the Missionary Sisters of Service. I think um, connecting with the history of, of what the John Wallace Memorial Lecture is trying to do and trying to um, carry on the charism and the passion of the sisters we thank you for that because you've connected what you were offering with what the sisters have done for so many decades. Thank you. I'd like to do, do a little diversion here because um, a couple of years ago, the Social Justice Commission of this diocese awarded a social justice award to um, Megan Brown. Would you like to stand up, Megan? Okay. Thank you. Um, this, Megan is, um, has been supported and funded by the Highways and Byways, and the Diocese Social Justice Commission recognises that. And we are grateful for the, for the sisters and the Highways and Byways um, organisation for supporting her and recognising what she does. Tim, you have reminded us also to interrupt injustice. You've done so much of that over the last number of decades. Um, whether it be getting your hands dirty on the day-to-day -day practical stuff, or whether it be the challenging of policies. So we'd like to say thank you for that. And just before um, we started today, Tim and I had a little conversation, and we mentioned one um, Dutch Reformed theologian, missiologist, a fellow called David Bosch, um, who wrote a book um, in the early 1990s called Transforming Mission. And in some ways, what's really um, interesting is a Baptist and a Catholic are enjoying the contributions of a Dutch Reformed theologian. <laughs> We've come a long way since Vatican II. We've come a long way since the pre-Vatican Church. I know it took almost 500 years before we were willing to stand side by side with the Lutherans and the Anglicans and, and the Baptists. It's taken too long. But look at the joy. Look at the um, richness of our walking together, of our listening to each other. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming to a Catholic gathering with all that you bring. We appreciate. Thank you.
doesn't interfere. Now, I've just got a final couple of thank yous. When we started to organise this lecture, we had no idea what 2023 was going to bring to the sisters and to myself personally. So, we'd like... Oh, sorry. I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> so, I just want to thank St Teresa's Parish and the school for allowing us to use the facilities again. To Michael Gatt for all the work he's put into recording his expertise and assistance with the sound and taping and his attention to detail is extraordinary. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> and our heart. So we can all enjoy this again tomorrow or the next day and the next day and share it with others. And to all who've contributed to setting up the general organisation of this, to Sister Nancy for her hospitality for Tim. And just finally, I want to make two, mention of two special people who've contributed enormously and this event wouldn't have happened without it. Loretta Coman with her extraordinary attention to detail here, getting things out and to Pat Quinn. We couldn't have done it without you, Pat. <laughs> it just wouldn't have been possible. So on that note, let's go and have some afternoon tea. <laughs> and it's that way. <laughs> Thank you.